Amen. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. We are continuing our study on in the book, The Prodigal God. And this is dealing with the elder brother. This, uh, this lesson is called The Self-Salvation Project. You're going to find out why in just a minute. This is the elder brother and his self-salvation project. I want us to, to just kind of brush up again on what we're looking at. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse number 25. Now his older son was in the field. We've already talked about the younger son, the one that is called the prodigal. Now his older son was in the field. And when he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe, the father, uh, he's received him safe. Your father has killed the fatted calf. Verse 28, but he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to him, uh, uh, said, excuse me, so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may, may, I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. What you're going to hear tonight, you've probably heard in some capacity already in this series or, or just being in church. But I pray the Holy Spirit helps us to understand something new dealing with this today. And if you followed Christ for any length of time, those of us that have grown up here in the Bible Belt, uh, especially this is quite possibly one of the most important messages, I believe, that you and I are ever going to study. This is something you and I have, have really got to get every now and then. There's something that changes your life on the road, the journey, uh, path of your walk with God, every now and then there's road signs, there's road markers that, that are a reminder of here's a place where God did this in your life and here's a place where God did this in your life. What I'm praying is as uh, we are going through this series, this study, that God is going to get hold of you and it's going to put a, a, a sign in your path that says at this time in your life, God revealed something to you about yourself and about your own walk with the Lord. Most people who read the, the parable of the prodigal son concentrate just on the character of the, the younger son, uh, his repentance of the father's forgiveness, and that's all good. And yet, uh, uh, if we look at this text, it doesn't return now back to the prodigal. The prodigal is hardly ever mentioned again after this. Uh, from now on, it starts looking at the father and the older son. This is a story of two sons who are both alienated from the father. Both of them are assaulting the unity of the family. Not just the prodigal, but the other one as well. Jesus wants us to compare and to contrast both of these. Uh, the younger son is lost. It's easy to see. We see him shaming his father. We see him ruining the family's reputation. He's sleeping with prostitutes. And we can say, yes, there, uh, this is somebody who is spiritually lost. And yet Jesus points out that the older son is lost too. So there's three things you're going to see here tonight. One is that uh, I want us to see a starting new, uh, to have a new understanding of lostness. That lost is not simply the younger brother. There is, in this atmosphere, a sense of lostness that we need to see. We need to see what the signs of that are and how we could recognize in ourselves, And then what we can do about this condition. Now, first of all, let's look at this new understanding of what lostness is. Look at verse 28. Keep your Bibles open right there. Verse 28 says, but he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. The elder brother would, uh, um, would have known 
that the day of the prodigal's return was probably one of the greatest in the father's life. Just by watching how the father was reacting, just by watching what the father was doing, he would know this is a significant moment in the dad's life. The father has killed the fatted calf. We talked about this a little bit last time, that the fatted calf was an enormously expensive extravagance. I mean, this is something way and beyond, especially for a culture that didn't eat meat at every meal like a lot of us do simply because meat was expensive. And uh, so you saved, especially the fatted calf, you saved the fatted calf for a special occasion because it was a delicacy. The older son uh, realized his father was ecstatic with joy. All the dancing, all the music, all the making merry. He could probably hear his father laughing. If you're like, like me, I can, I can spot my dad's uh, voice out in the crowd. I can, when my dad's talking, when he's laughing, uh, uh, he, he's kind of loud. I can, I can pick him out. And, and he could probably hear his father in the midst of all this. He knew his dad was happy. Yet he refused to go in to probably what was one of the biggest feasts that his father ever put on. We don't see a mother in this story, so we have to, it's a fictional story. And yet without the mother there, you have to assume she's not, she's not around anymore. She's passed away. So you don't know what has taken place when the children are born or anything like that. But at this moment, because his son came home, there's something special about this moment. And in this moment, he realizes, dad's happy, but I am not. And he refuses to go in there to this feast that his father has put on. And this this is, is a remarkable act of disrespect to the father. You might as well have spit on him. You might as well have slapped him in the face. This is, this, there's not much more the son could do that was disrespectful to the father because it was his way of saying, have you know actions speak louder than words? <clears throat> there's some things you say, but you say a whole lot more through your actions and your body language. And what he was saying was, I will not be a part of this family and I do not respect your headship of it. Now think about that. And go back to the Old Testament and reread where it says, if you got a son like this, take him outside the city. And don't do it inside. Take him outside the city and kill him. Stone him to death because he is. You do not allow that sin of rebellion to stay in the camp of Israel. So here's a son that's acting like this. And, and he, is, he is shocked and amazed at the lavishing of love that the father is willing to give this prostitute monger not realizing that the father is in turn giving the same grace to this one. Just as this one ought to be put to death, so should this one. The sad part is he doesn't even realize it. The father had to go out and plead with him. Just as he, was, uh, he went out to bring his alienated son back into the family, he saw, he saw the prodigal son way out there, and he ran out there to him, and he ushered him back in. And that son said, I don't want to come home. Please, just let me stay out here at the fields. Let me eat with the farmhands. Let me just be one of your employees. And he said, no, come on. And he had to coax the son. That one, that one felt unworthy, and he had to drag him back in. But now he's having to come out side and practically having to drag this one in the house as well. Fascinating. Something I didn't catch until I started studying this. And he was having to do the same thing for this older brother. Do you realize what Jesus was saying to his listeners in that moment as he is to us right now? He's saying the older brother is lost also. Not just the younger, but the older too. The father uh, uh, represents God, and the meal is the feast of salvation that, that the Lord prepares for us. And in the end, the younger son, the immoral one, is the one that comes in and gets saved. He comes in, the, the feasting that is salvation, where everybody's celebrating. What does the Bible say when, a, when somebody gets saved? It says that heaven rejoices over one that commits their life to God. Heaven throws a party. The angels celebrate. That's what you're seeing in this moment. The wayward son has come home. What is happening? All of the father's area that he oversees, his little bit of a kingdom, if you would, is all celebrating in that moment because one has come home. That's what heaven does for you and I. 
And yet here you have one that won't be a part of it. The good son, the good son refuses to go in and is lost. The lost is found, but the one that never left is even more lost than the one who ran away. The Pharisees who were listening to this parable, they knew exactly what this meant. This was a, a, a complete reversal of everything they believed because they believed that we are to uh, uh, be separate from them, be apart from them. Uh, uh, what does the Bible say? Come out from among them and be ye separate. Can I tell you, we do that too well, too well. The church has come out from among the world and tried to be separate to the point that we have no relevance in speaking into our world. That's why there's a lot of people that you'll have people in the church that says, hey, you don't have any business in politics. Church has no business in politics. Well, guess what? The world says that too. In my opinion, we need to be busy in everything that God puts in our path. If we, listen, listen. When it says come out from among them and be ye separate, it means if that person is going to lead you away from God, don't have that kind of intimate relationship that if you lay down with the dogs, you're going to get fleas. But how am I going to impact somebody's life if I, if I sever all relationships with people that don't go to church? Then what good am I? Do you realize that the average Christian, this was something that I came across as, as a pastor years ago. It said the average shelf life of a Christian is six months. After six months from salvation, if a person as an adult gets saved and becomes a Christian, they have six months until they'll hit a plateau and they'll ride that plateau out the rest of their life. And that plateau will be surrounding themselves and immersing themselves in church culture to the point that all of their friends are right here. That is a condemning statement. What was Jesus? Jesus was a friend of sinners. And we will, we will so immerse ourselves in church culture that we will no longer be relevant in reaching lost people. Because our idea now of reaching lost people is, well, you're just in sin and you need to get down there and make things right. Shame on you for how you act. Come on. Have you ever had that done to you? Now, some of us deserve some of that if we're misbehaving. But generally, that's not a good form of evangelism. People don't need to be told they're bad. They already feel that way. Instead, what they need to feel is that love and grace that says, come home. Right. Come home. I love that. Love the old song that says, come home, come home. It's supper time. I, I don't know about you, but look, I've been lost. And I still make mistakes. And I'm waiting for my heavenly father to say, hey, Mike, it's time. Come home. Come home to heaven and eat dinner with me. Hallelujah. I won't have to have no more Pepsids or nothing. I can eat whatever I want. Thank you, Jesus. Not listen to those doctors, what they told me today. Here's the key of this. What is it that was keeping the older brother out? What was keeping the older brother from coming in to, to celebrating with the family? What was keeping him out of being in the Father's will? The answer is in what he says in verse 29. He says this, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed. All these years I've been slaving for you and I have never disobeyed you. The good son is not lost in spite of his good behavior, but because of his good behavior. Let me say that again. The good son is not lost in spite of his good behavior, but because of his good behavior. So it is not sin keeping him out, it's his righteousness. This is going to challenge you. I'm telling you right now, this is going to challenge you. If you got a book, uh, uh, turn with me to page 43. I want to read you something. Page 43. The author says, uh, is speaking of another book that he read. He said, in her novel called Wise Blood, Flannery O'Connor, the author, says of her character, Hazel Motes, said that, quote, there was a deep, black, wordless conviction in him that the way to avoid Jesus was to avoid sin. 
there was a deep, wordless conviction in him that the way to avoid Jesus was to avoid sin. This is a profound insight. You can avoid Jesus as Savior by keeping all the moral laws. If you do that, then you have rights. God owes you answered prayers and a good life. Somebody listen to me, would you? Listen to me. If you do these things by keeping the moral law, then you have rights. God owes you answered prayers and a good life and a ticket to heaven when you die. You don't need a Savior who pardons you by free grace. You are your own Savior. That is in blunt statement form of what many of us believe but have never put into words. It's what many in church life and church culture have, have felt yet never put into words and never realized that it's wrong. The gospel is neither religion nor is it irreligion. The gospel is not morality nor is it immorality. This was uh, completely an ast uh, astonishing and confusing to Jesus' hearers that day because that's not how they were trained. And it's probably going to be astonishing to hear you hear this tonight. Now, why is the older son lost? Listen. Because sin is not just breaking the rules. Sin is putting yourself in the place of God as Savior, Lord, and Judge, just as each son sought to displace the authority of the Father in his own life. Each one of the sons said to the Father, I don't need you, I can live my own way. One went this way, one went that way. Both of them were wrong. Why? Because they no longer needed the Father. They no longer needed him. The younger, uh, uh, the younger brother wanted his father's wealth, but not the father. So how did he get what he wanted? He left home and broke all the moral laws that the father had, broke all the rules. But it becomes evident by the end of the story that the older brother also wanted selfish control of the father's wealth. He was very unhappy with the father's use of the possessions, like the robe and the ring and the calf. He did not appreciate what the father did. You have to understand, everything the father has now belongs to the older son. But because he brings the son back in and he puts his own robe of authority on him, he puts his own ring of authority on on him. What is he doing? He's bringing him back into the family. Hence, he's putting him back in the will. Oh. Have you ever seen a will get fought over before? Have you ever seen people get stupid? Mom and daddy aren't even dead yet and you're already trying to take their stuff. There ain't nothing. There is nothing causes more frustrations in families than stuff. I remember when my grandmother was passing away, and 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 uh, she she got her kids and her grandkids together, and uh, uh, and and she said, uh, "Hey, let's you know." Take some masking tape and we'll just put it on stuff and, and write your name on it. You know, I'd go ahead and claim it now. I don't want you fighting over it. I'd rather you claim it now so there's no fight when it's all said and done. And I remember walking through the house because I, I didn't live right there. So when I got to her house, well, I started walking through and everything was taped. <laughs> there wasn't much left. I didn't need her stuff. I wanted her. Amen. I wanted her. I, we wound up with a couple things of hers, but, but that wasn't the important thing. The important thing was her. But yet in here, you see, they don't want the father. They want the father's stuff. And he's very unhappy with how the father is doing things. Can I tell you, we become very unhappy with how God does things without even realizing we're getting upset with God. Because we see people and say, Lord, throw some lightning on their head and God doesn't do it. But when we're in trouble, what do we say? Oh, God, don't strike me with lightning. Please, please, please. And then God doesn't strike us with lightning. We're saying, oh, what a great God you are. But if God doesn't just smite those Philistines over there on the other side of town, what do we say? God, you don't love me. Oh, maybe that grace is really for all 
of us. All of us. And so here he is, the older brother, upset with the father. And while the younger brother got control of his stuff by running away, we see the older brother has got control by staying home and being very good. By being very good, he was able to take the father's stuff. And he felt that now he has the right to tell the father what to do with his possessions because he has obeyed him perfectly. I have been here. I have been here. And I deserve. I deserve. So there are two ways to be your own Savior and your own Lord. One is by breaking all the laws and being bad. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do what I want to do. So what have you done? You become your own God. The other one is by keeping all the laws and being good, thereby saying, Lord, I don't need your help to be holy. I got this on my own. I love the way you're shouting. Hallelujah. <laughs> Stay with me. Stay with me. Think about this. If I can be so good that God has to answer my prayer and give me a good life and take me to heaven, then all I do may be, uh, then, then in all I do, I may be looking to Jesus to be my helper and my rewarder, but he is not my savior. I am my own savior. He helps me with things, but I'm really making all this happen. I do this. I do this. I think one of the greatest places where we come to is where we say, God, I can't. I can't. I can't do this on my own. And he says, good. <laughs> I'm glad you finally come to that realization because I can't help you if you don't let me. Kind of like a child bringing you a toy or something that needs to be fixed. And he says, mama, fix this. And you go to take it and they won't let go of it. I can't fix it if you don't let go of it. That's exactly what we do. Exactly what we do. The difference between a religious person and a true Christian is that the religious person obeys God to get control over God and the things from God. But the Christian obeys just to get God and just to love and please and draw closer to him. There's a difference. Now, I want you to think about this because here, let me take my glasses off so I don't see your face, okay? <laughs> Judge yourself. Do I come to God so I can get stuff or do I come to God so I can get him? Is there a majority of my prayer time, Lord, help me with this and give me that and do that for me or do I spend a good amount of time saying, Lord, I just love you? Is the only time you talk to God saying, Lord, give me, or do you have those moments where you don't ask for nothing, you just say, Lord, I love you. If all I do in, in talking to my wife is say, woman, go make me a sandwich. Woman, go do the laundry. Woman, go to, if y'all know my wife, she ain't gonna tolerate that long at all. You got two feet, two hands, go do it yourself. If all I ever talk to her is do this for me, what kind of a relationship do I have? It's not one of intimacy. I have got to, yeah, she's a slave. I have got to be in a place where I'm not just saying do this, do this, do this. I've got to come to a place where I just say, I love you. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. I adore you. There's got to be those moments, guys, Women, where you look at your spouse and all you do is you just tell them you love them. Not because of what they do or just in response to something they did for you. Because that's exactly what we do with God. It's exactly what we do with God. There's a parable by a woman named Elizabeth Elliot. She said it this way. Jesus says to his disciples, I'd like for you to carry a stone for me. Peter, being a practical guy, gets the smallest one that he could carry because he don't want to have to carry much, and he puts it in his pocket. And at lunch, Jesus turns that stone into bread. Well, that's a small stone. That ain't much bread. Jesus again says, I'd like for you to carry a stone for me. 
So Peter this time grabs a great big stone. Why? Because it's going to be a big loaf of bread. And at supper time, Jesus says, throw it in the water and follow me. <laughs> Peter gets angry. He gets confused. What? You're not going to turn it into bread? And Jesus looks at Peter and says, who were you carrying the stone for? Amen. For you or for me? Was I carrying that stone because Jesus asked me to? Or was I carrying that stone because I knew what he's going to turn it into for me? What if, listen, what if God doesn't give you what you want? What if you don't, if, if the Lord says, I've got this for you and it doesn't turn out to be what you wanted. The Lord says, Ed, I'm going to give you a brand new car. And it's a Pinto. Man, it ain't no good car. If you had a Pinto, I apologize. <laughs> I saw today they had on, on, uh, on Microsoft, on, on the uh, MSN, they said like the worst, ugliest, most horrible 20 cars in history. And the one they were showing, my family had two. <laughs> I remember the old AMC Gremlins. Remember that thing? Oh my goodness. We had two of them. I, my day, and it was one of those back when they first started, you know, they pull the, pull the license plate down and then put your gas in. And, and they had uh, uh, on, the, um, on the gas cap was this gremlin. And people were stealing those gas caps because that stupid little thing that was on there. And so, I mean, my dad would look like a Molotov cocktail. He had a rag stuff down in there. Well, God help us if that rag caught on fire. But, uh, I mean, we had two of those, and they were calling it the worst vehicles ever. I like my gremlin. Think about it. What if, what if God says, I'm going to give you a new car? Well, I got in mind not only what I want it to be, but what color I want it to be. And then God rolls up with a 1974 gremlin. Be thankful. Because sometimes what gives us, God gives us isn't what we wanted, it's what we needed. Lord says, I will never let you go without food. But peanut butter and crackers wasn't what I had in mind. Bread and water wasn't what I had in mind. You get down to all you got left is a couple tortillas and a thing of peanut butter, and you're saying, come on, Jesus. Next week, I'm going to have a slide that says the prodigal media people, right? <laughs> <There>. <laughs> uh. I want you to think about this. Elder brothers expect their goodness to pay off. I've been good, therefore, ergo, God must be good back to me. Have you know, we don't deserve anything. What did, the man came up to Jesus and said, Good teacher. And what did Jesus say? Why do you call me good? There's no one good but the Father. Amen. Jesus never sinned, yet Jesus never claimed to be good. Yet we will try to be good. And I'm talking to the church here today. I'm, I'm whooping us believers today. We want to be good because we want stuff. We want God's blessings. We expect our goodness to pay off. And elder brothers think that they can control life by their performances. If I am good, these things will happen. If I pay my tithe, I will never do without money. Have you ever paid your tithe and times were still tough? Just because I paid my tithe doesn't mean I'm rolling in the money. But I'll tell you this, it means I'm able to be blessed. If I want to be blessable, then I must be faithful. If I'm not faithful, I'm not blessable. And there are times when, when we pay our tithe, and I mean it's pay a bill or pay a tithe. Pay the tithe. If they turn off the lights, they turn off the lights. 
but we will be faithful to our God. And what happens? God's faithful to us. But if I'm giving my $10 in the offering plate because I'm wanting God to give me 100 in return, mm -mm. that's not how that works. We do it all the time because we expect our good deeds to pay off with great glory, that God's going to do something. Why? Because I deserve it. Think about this. I get it because I'm going to get it because I deserve it. Why I pray more than anybody else. Why I study the word of God more than anybody else. I come to church more than anybody else. I deserve it. What do you and I really deserve? In the words of Johnny Cash, I fell into a burning <laughs> ring of fire. That's exactly what we deserve. We deserve hell. We deserve it. What are the signs of lostness? Look at verses 29 and 30. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Some people are complete elder brothers. That's all they are. They, they don't know how to be anything else. They go to church, they obey the Bible, but out of expectation for what God owes them. I do these godly things, I live this godly life because I want God to do these things for me. They never understood the biblical gospel at all. They never understood grace. Many Christians who know the gospel are nonetheless elder brother-ish. We may not be completely in that, yet we have moments where we dabble in that sort of thing. Despite the fact that they know the gospel of salvation by grace with their heads, their hearts go back to that elder brother-ish mentality of default mode of self-salvation. And here's a, here's a few things of what elder brothers, uh, their attitude looks like. First of all, is a deep anger. Verse 28 says, he became very angry, very angry. Have you have noticed that sometimes Christians are the angriest people in the world? You ever notice that? You can almost tell who's, who's a Christian because of how angry you are. That, that, does, that dog doesn't hunt at all, at all. I've seen, I've seen those in, 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 uh, that, that are of the more uh, traditional Pentecostal persuasion, and I look at them, and they don't look happy at all. Demas Shakarian, the gentleman who started uh, Full Gospel Fellowship of Businessmen's International uh, years ago, my, that's really what got my father into God and got him saved, was the Full Gospel uh, Businessmen's Fellowship. And uh, Demas Shakarian wrote a book called The Happiest People in the World. He was talking about Christians. Christians ought to be the happiest people in the world. And yet you look at a lot of Christians and the joy of the Lord is my strength. You've seen, come on, you laugh because you've seen it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If they got baptized, it was in pickle juice, it wasn't in water. They are so sour. Walking around like they've been sucking on sour persimmons just <laughs> everywhere they go. Like they're just not happy at all. You know what I'm talking about. They're angry. Elder brothers believe that God owes them a comfortable and a good life if they try hard and live up to standards, and they have. They have lived up to those standards, so they deserve things. So they say, my life ought to be going really well, and when it doesn't, they get angry, but they're forgetting Jesus. He lived a life better than any of us and yet suffered more horribly than any of us ever have. There was uh, one gentleman I remember uh, years ago sang with a uh, Southern Gospel group back down in Central Texas. I remember they come through all the time and I loved them, Had bought their cassette tapes, man, listened to their stuff, I, I, I enjoyed them, loved their testimony. Here's a man who was on, a, he, he was uh, mainlining drugs, I mean, IV user. This guy was living on the streets and everything and he got saved, his wife got saved, 
their kids, they raised their kids for Christ. I mean, the whole family was in this singing group and uh, doing fantastic for 10 years. This man was, a, was an ordained minister, uh, traveling. I mean, a successful uh, uh, singing ministry booked. I mean, they didn't have to hunt. People were calling him up, come sing in our church, come do this stuff. And then one day he's not feeling good. He starts getting sick. He goes to the doctor and the doctor says, you have AIDS. Going back to that time when he was not careful about how he did drugs, he was using uh, uh, needles that he shouldn't have been using from other people. He contracted AIDS through that. It lay dormant in his body. All through, through this time of ministry, what has been residing in his body? That germ of AIDS has been sitting there. And at such a moment, it came to. And now he's got AIDS. And the man immediately got mad at God, backslid, went back to that lifestyle, and died in it within a year. Was dead. Left the whole family reeling, trying to figure out, well, what do we do? How do we, we can't continue singing because daddy was the bedrock of all this. What do we do? Left his whole family in a lurch. He got mad. Why? Because unfortunately, he had developed an older brother mentality. I've done all this for God, and God let me down. Can I tell you, if God ever lets you down, you'll be the first one in history that he's ever let down. Elder brothers are angry. Elder brothers are a joyless, and they have a joyless and mechanical obedience. Verse 29 says, I have been slaving for you, the NIV says. Uh, New King James said, uh, I have been, for these many years, I have been serving you. I have been a slave to you. I've been doing all this work for you. When I do a work for God, who am I really doing it for? It ought to be God. It ought to be God. Why? Look at all this rock that I put up. Look at this beautiful pulpit that I built. Somebody needs to congratulate me on this. I didn't put that up and I didn't build this. Otherwise, it have fell apart a long time ago. But <laughs> let's just say, for instance, I built this. Somebody needs to recognize what I do. And nobody does. Harumph. I'll go find me a new church where I will be appreciated. Blessed be my name. And therefore, who have I done it for? It wasn't for God. It was for me. Yeah. Pastors have a hard time with this. Because we like people to come up and say, hey, pastor, you did a good job. Hey, pastor, we, you know, we like attaboys. But a lot of times people don't see us as needing an attaboy. We give you a paycheck. You don't need an attaboy. And we start feeling like people don't like us. This is just the truth. And so pastors will pick up their toys and leave. Why? Because I don't feel appreciated. Who am I doing this for? Who are you doing this for? This life that you're living the service that you give. There are some people who will say, oh, you know what? Why, I want to be up here on the platform. Follow me, Dan. Dan, the cameraman's with me right there. I want to be on the platform. I want to be preaching the gospel. Why, I want to be singing so everybody sees me. I remember growing up in church. We started going to a Pentecostal church. And uh, I used to laugh at them. Because Pentecostals, you guys have your own way of doing things. You guys are crazy. And I remember watching them because I see some of these ladies, they get up there, beautiful, immaculate dressed. I mean, just, I mean, look like they walked off uh, the set of, uh, of TBN or, or PTL. It was back at the time Jim Baker had his show and all that, and everybody wore their makeup like Tammy Faye. I'll leave that there. Some of y'all remember who she was. And, and I remember... I remember watching women would be up on the platform and they'd sing and they as they would sing and praise the Lord. Oh, oh, oh. I had to make sure that light was shining on that ring. Just Lord, boy, they found it. Yes, I found the glory. No, you found the light. That's what you did. Got that light shining on that big old sparkly stone. Literally, I saw them doing that. And I remember as a high schooler thinking, that's the most crazy thing I've ever seen in my life. What were they doing it for? Not for God. That was not for God. That was for themselves. But it's amazing how many people say, Oh, Pastor Mike, I want to preach on a Sunday morning. 
Pastor Mike, I want to sing a song. Pastor Mike, I want to do something where everybody sees it. I want my picture on the wall. Hey, can you mow the grass for me? Absolutely not. Hey, can you help me set up some chairs and tables? Ah, I got to go. Hey, you mind scrubbing the toilet? Mm -mm. Had a had a had a youth pastor tell a pastor. Had a pastor was talking to me. We vent about our youth pastor sometimes. We got good youth pastors. I'm kidding. But we, we I had this pastor tell me. He said, "This pastor said I have a youth pastor that I ask him to go pull the wallpaper off the wall simply because it got wet. We're having to replace the wall." I said, I need you to go pull that wallpaper off because I have a man coming to take care of that wall. And the youth pastor said, I don't do wallpaper. He said, I'm not asking you to put it up, just tear it down. I don't do wallpaper. And so while the pastor was gone, he went and asked one of the, one of the ladies in the church, would you please come get this wallpaper down off the wall? You can call it delegation. What I call it is, is laziness and pride. One of my first youth pastors, I showed up at the church. Brother, Brother Leslie Thompson was a pastor. And Brother Thompson, uh, as soon as I got there, he's in his slacks, his dress shirt. He said, good to have you here, Mike. Follow me. So he walked back to the back. And it's a, it's a men's bathroom. It's one of the, just a little one toilet job right there. And, and, and uh, he gets, and doesn't talk to me. Gets down on his knees. He squirts stuff in the toilet. He grabs some cleaner and some paper towels. He cleans the sink. He cleans the toilet, wipes it all down, brushes it all down, does all that, washes his hands, gets everything's all cleaned up. He said, now, you've seen me do it. Don't ever let me hear you say you won't. I appreciate it. He led by example. What happens if we are only obedient because of what we get out of it? There, an older brother uh, uh, obeys God as a means to an end, as a way to get the things that they really love. I don't love serving my God. I love getting things. Of course, obedience to God is sometimes extremely hard. And older brothers find obedience virtually always a joyless, mechanical, slavish thing as a result. I don't get what I want, so I get upset. There was a, a, a story that goes about a gardener who came to a king, and he brought this carrot. It was a ginormous carrot. It was a great big carrot. It was a beautiful thing. And he brought this carrot, and he brought it to the king. And uh, he was a poor man, a poor farmer, and he handed it to the king, and the king said, that's beautiful. I love it. Tell you what, you've done such a good job. I'm going to give you about 10 acres over here, and I'm going to, it's your land, but I'd like for you to farm it for me if you would. The man's joyous. He's received land from the king. Yes, sir, I will. Well, there's a man watching it, and he sees this, and he said, he gave that guy 10, 10 acres for a carrot. I raise horses. I wonder what he'd give me for a horse. So he goes out and gets one of his horses, and he brings it to the king. Oh, king, here's your wonderful, beautiful horse. And the king says, that is a beautiful horse. Thank you, I appreciate it. And it has it taken to the barn. And the man's standing around. And he's standing around, and he realizes he's not, king's not saying anything to him. And he starts getting upset. And the king looks at him and says, what's your problem? And he said, a man brings you a carrot, and you give him 10 acres? I bring you a horse that's worth a whole lot more, and you don't give me anything. And the king said, well, that's easy. The man gave me the carrot for me. You gave me a horse for yourself. It's a whole different motive behind what you're doing. Can I tell you, there's got to be a right motive behind what we do. Third thing is there's a coldness to the younger brother types. In verse 30, he says, this son of whose? This son of yours. The older son will not even own his own brother. Elder brothers are too disdainful of others, unlike themselves, to even be effective in evangelism. Have you ever seen people in the church that says, we don't want that kind in our church? I've had it. I've had it. I've had them tell me before. Pastor Mike, we, we, had, we, had, we had like new converts coming out the ears. And new converts don't know how to tithe. Hey, baby. And so... 
I actually had them say, our evangelism strategy, Pastor, we need to quit getting all these baby Christians and we need to start evangelizing for tithers. I said, I said hold on. This wasn't in this church. You, you can let your breath out. And I said, you got to be kidding me. You want me to go get tithers? Yes, Pastor, we do. Well, if they're tithing and really tithing, that means they go to a church somewhere. So you want me to go to somebody else's church and get their people and bring them over to our church. And they were absolutely okay with it. Hey, baby, you're so sweet. I like her. I'm going to get rid of my kids. I'm going to take her home. So elder brothers, elder brothers don't even like, they don't even like people who are not like them. And odds are people that are just like them, they don't even like them either. But elder brothers, they just, they don't like, they don't like the lost. They don't like things like that. I remember as a youth pastor being told I had to keep the teenagers in the other building because we don't want them over here because they mess up the carpet. They get fingerprints on the doors. They get, finger, they get grime on the, on the walls and we have to repaint the walls. They stink. They did. These were bus kids. They stink. We don't want them over here. Keep them over there. Can I tell you, if they're not fit for in here, we have a problem. Amen. This place should be open for whosoever will. Amen. They lack, an elder brother lacks an assurance of the father's love. Keep this in mind. Is any of this striking home? If it, is any of this hitting your own heart? Don't think of somebody else. Is this hitting your own heart? A lack of assurance of the Father's love. Verse 29 says, you never threw me a party. Therefore, I don't know that you love me. You obviously love him. He's a sinner bound for hell, but you threw him a party, but you never gave me one. As long as you are trying to earn your salvation by controlling God through your goodness, you will never be sure that you have ever been good enough. If you struggle with the thoughts of, am I good enough for God? Be very careful. That's older brother territory. And it stems from a lack of self-love. When the Lord says, love the Lord God with all your heart and love your neighbor as your what? As yourself. I hate me. Therefore, I'm going to give you the same love that I give myself. If I hate me, I hate you. And that's usually what we do. That's the love we give. And we never feel good enough. What are the signs of this? Every time something goes wrong in your life, you begin to wonder if it's a punishment. If something goes wrong, oh, I must have offended God. I must have done something wrong. God saw what I did, oh, and I'm paying for it right now. If that's the way you feel, then you need to be careful. We also, if we're an elder brother, another sign of that is irresolvable guilt. I can never ask for enough forgiveness. I did something wrong. Oh, I shouldn't have done it. Lord, forgive me. 15 minutes later, oh God, I just feel terrible. Lord, forgive me. A day later, oh, I feel so terrible. God, forgive me. God forgave you the first time you asked. We have not forgiven ourselves. And this irresolvable guilt that we have, that's that older brother. We don't like ourselves. And that will in turn Make us not like others. We don't feel like we have the Father's love. We live under the fear that if I do something wrong, I'm going to hell. I'm going to set you up. Please don't anybody answer this. How many sins does it take to lose your salvation? Don't answer that. Because if you say one, you are an elder brother. I love you. If you say one, one sin is all it takes to lose your salvation. Then where is grace? Where is the blood of Jesus Christ? Where is the love that covers a what? A multitude of sins. If one sin will keep me out of heaven, can I tell you, then, then Jesus didn't bleed out blood, he bled out water. If our salvation is that easy to lose, we have a problem, friend. And you need to hear that. Just because I sin doesn't mean I've blown it. Did I make a mistake? Yes. There's been plenty of times I've made a mistake in our marriage. Does that mean my wife threw me outside? No. Did she almost kill me? Yes. But she didn't throw me outside. It's a difference. 
But we are so consumed with the thought, if I mess up, God doesn't love me. If I mess up, I'm going to be punished for it. I've got a flat tire. God's judging me. Dog bit me. God's judging me. My mail got shredded or lost. God's judging me. That's an older brother mentality. That's not God. We begin to, we, we, we don't have this intimacy with God. There's a, a when we pray, I mean, there, there, there's no love there. It's, 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 we pray for a lot of things, but there's no love in that prayer. There's no loving communication with God. Is any of this striking home? Just think about it. The last one is, is that there's an unforgiving judgmental spirit. The older brother does not want the father to forgive the younger brother. He doesn't want him forgiven. He wants him gone. Gone. A, a, a total lack of, un, uh, of forgiveness. It is impossible to forgive someone if you feel I would never do anything that bad. If I feel like I wouldn't do anything as act like how they're doing, you'll never be able to forgive them then. You never will. Because in truth, however somebody acts towards you, is nothing compared to what you have done to God. If God can forgive you of your sins, then we can forgive one another of the things that we've done. Somebody say amen. amen. You have to be something of an older brother if you refuse to forgive. The lost, and, and that lost generation of elder brothers, you know, we, we basically turn them into younger brothers. They go from here to there and never even realize it. So here's what we need to do, and I'm, I'm not trying to go long, but man, there's just some powerful stuff here. Hang in here with me. Let's, let's bring this to a close. What can we do about this kind of a spiritual, spiritual condition? First, we've got to see the uniqueness of the gospel. Jesus ends the parable with the lostness of the older brother in order to get across his point of a more dangerous spiritual condition. The younger brother knew he was alienated from the father, but the older brother did not. The older brother felt like he was right by getting on to the father. He thought he was okay, but he was just as lost as the younger one and never knew it. If you tell moral religious people who are trying to be good and they're trying to obey the Bible so that God will bless them, if you tell them that they are alienated from God, they will become offended. They'll become offended. If you try to tell them there's sin in their life, they become offended. Because look at all that I do. I go to church. If you know you're sick, you may go to a doctor. But if you don't know that you're sick, you won't go to a doctor and you could die. How are you going to know that you're wrong if you're not listening to the Holy Spirit convict you? I've had older brothers that have come to me and have told me, Mike, you've got sin in your life. You're not going to make heaven. Why? Because you got on shorts. You've heard clothesline preaching, you know. <laughs> you're a pastor and you wear shorts? I don't even know that you're saved. How do you tell me that? Guess what I wore for the next week? Shorts. <laughs> I did. That spirit of meddling came all over me. I just, one of those gifts I have. We've got to be able to be a people that, that says, God, I want what you want, not what I want. I want your morality, not my own. It's not about what I want. It's about what you want. Moralistic religion works on the principle of I obey, therefore God accepts me. The gospel, this word right here, that's not what it says. This says I am accepted by God through Jesus Christ, therefore I obey. I don't obey so I can get something. I obey because he loves me. He loves me. He showed himself on a cross to die for me. He raised up from the dead. He forgave me of my sins. He loved me when nobody else would. I love him, and because I love him, I will obey him. Not because I'm trying to get something out of him. These are two radically different opposite dynamics, two totally different thoughts. And yet both sets of people sit in church together, both pray, both obey the Ten Commandments, but for radically different reasons. This one over here for one, this one over here for the other. We'll sit in church, but one will get God and the other will miss God. One will stand before the Lord and the Lord will say, come on in, I got a place welcome for you at the table. And the other one will hear God say, depart from me, I never knew you. 
And their response will be what? But Lord, Lord, did we not do these things for you? Because they do these things with different reasons, they have different results, different kinds of character. One produces anger and a joyless compliance, a superiority and insecurity and a condemning spirit, but the other inevitably produces contentment and joy. Living for God brings humility and a poise and a, and a forgiving spirit. And unless a person and a congregation, hear me, church, as a church, we have to know the difference between general religiosity and the true gospel. We got to know the difference between living for God and living with God. There's two totally different thoughts there. People will constantly fall into moralism, that whole elder brotherishness. They're going to fall for it. And matter of fact, not only will they fall for it, we'll start training up people that as soon as they come to an altar and ask Christ in their heart, we're going to raise them up to become what? Older brothers. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus said to the Pharisees, who he was talking to about this, and he said, you'll go to the other side of the world and make a convert and make him twice the son of hell that you are. In God's name. You make him twice the son of hell that you are in God's name. I believe we've got to see that, that if we're going to be that person that's not necessarily the younger brother, but we're not the older brother either, we've got to understand the vulnerability of Jesus. We've got to remember who Jesus was talking to. In this moment, the Pharisees, this was Jesus' mortal enemies. These were the ones Jesus knew were going to kill him. And what did he do? He was saying, don't stay outside, come in. Come in. Come into the table and be with us. Don't act like that. Change. He was trying to tell them there's something different. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Can I tell you at that moment, Jesus is telling them, saying, please stop, because you know not what you're doing. He was already foreshadowing what he's going to say on the cross. He's trying to tell the Pharisees right here in this parable, you're doing it wrong. Please stop. I'm not trying to put you in your place. I'm trying to give you a place at the table. But you're going to have to choose it. You're going to have to choose it. This love towards his enemies would eventually cost him his life. And on the cross, instead of blasting his enemies, he took the penalty of sin for them. Romans 5.10 says that while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. Think about that. Jesus didn't die for you when you got your Easter dress on or your nice three-piece suit and you're, and you're sitting in church with your patent leather Bible. That's not when Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you when you were shaking your fist in his face, when you were being rebellious and you say, I don't want you, God. I don't need you, God. I've got this on my own. That's when Jesus died for you. He died for us when we were his enemies. And knowing what he did for us Man, it ought to drain all that self-righteousness out of us. All that insecurity. When I look at that cross right there, when I look at that cross, all my righteousness should be gone because there's nothing I've ever done to deserve what Jesus did on that cross. And when I look at that cross, do you know what I ought to be seeing? Instead of my insecurities of, well, does Jesus love me? Does he care about me? All I got to do is look at that cross and know he loves me. It was my love, his love for me, that held him to that cross. It was that love when he was saying, you don't deserve it, but I give it to you anyway. I give you this love. I give you this love. How could I ever be insecure about my relationship with Jesus Christ? I know he loves me every time I look at a cross. I see the price he paid for me. Did I deserve it? No, but he did it anyway. Luke 18, 14 tells us that the proud are in, the humble are in, but the proud are out. The humble are the ones God's going to take care of, but the proud, you're on your own. You're on your own. Psalms 138, verse 6 says, the Lord cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. The, pre, the whole prerequisite of grace is to know that you need it. The whole prerequisite for grace 
is to know that you need it. I need grace. Therefore, if I need grace, I need to give grace. I don't know about you guys. I got my theology degrees hanging on the wall. I got scads of books that talk all about God. Done ministry for years. I deserve hell. You deserve hell. There is nothing any one of us has done that deserves our place in heaven. Well, I knelt at an altar and I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Praise God, it still doesn't mean you deserve heaven. It means you may get to go to heaven, but it doesn't mean you deserve it. Can I tell you, if I don't deserve, then I realize nobody else deserves. But if I am given grace, then I must be giving grace to those around me. Loving them to Jesus Christ and not condemning them. And not condemning myself. Not condemning myself. Self-hatred doesn't draw you closer to God. Hear that. Looking at yourself in the mirror and telling yourself that you hate yourself. Maybe you've just committed a sin and you look at your reflection and you say, I don't like who you are. You need to get over that. And start seeing yourself and loving yourself as Jesus Christ loves you. Any thoughts on this? I brought this out uh, actually in our uh, bridge class Sunday. And I probably mentioned it before, but the whole time that Pastor Mike is, is speaking on this older brother syndrome, I can't help but think when, uh, when Christ was going to, the, to, to Jerusalem to face his accusers to, to go to the cross on behalf of you and I, it was at this point that Peter had just acknowledged him as being the Christ, as being uh, the Son of God. And, and what an awesome revelation he had. Jesus told him in Matthew 16, uh, he said, uh, you know, blessed are you, Simon bar John, for flesh and blood to not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And uh, it was just maybe moments later, uh, not even a day, I'm sure, when Jesus makes his proclamation that he must go to Jerusalem. And here's where Peter steps in and says, not so, Lord. It shall not be unto you. And here's where one of the strongest rebukes in the gospel is mentioned when Jesus turns around and says, get behind me, Satan. Now, why do you think the rebuke was so strong? It's because Peter thought that Christ had an entitlement, that he didn't deserve to go to the cross to fulfill the purpose that the Father had put in his life. Just like you and I, we do the same thing, don't we? I don't deserve this sickness, God. I don't deserve whatever I'm going through. I don't deserve this. I don't Because we have the older brother mentality, I'm guilty, man. This thing's eating me up. I'm guilty because I've done that. I've been there. I've said those things in my own mind. You know, God, why are these things happening to me? I, you know, I'm, I'm faithful. I, I tithe. I go to church. I mean, I ought to be rolling in money. And, and that thought, that entitlement, I, I mean, after I hear what Jesus said to Peter, I must think how that disgusts the Father to think that I'm entitled to anything and I need his grace. Man, I need his grace. And if I need his grace, I must be giving his grace. Amen. Amen. Because if we, if we don't like who we are, then we're not going to like who anybody else is either. And we'll start picking apart people's lives. We'll start picking apart people's ministries. And, uh, and, and just start, well, you're, you don't sing good. You know, you don't preach good. Why? Yeah, uh, you don't do sign language good. You don't, you don't do any of these things very well. We'll pick, part, pick apart people, and God's over there saying, I approve of what you do. I love how you sing. I love what you do. Hmm. Any other thoughts? Then here's what I want us to do. If you bow your heads with me. Father, I pray right now. 
for a revelation of self-awareness. I pray right now, Lord God, for a revelation of who we really are. That, Father, if we recognize, if, if there's any of this in our life, Father, let it stand out in spotlight. If this stuff is in us, then, Father, let it glare us in the face. But, Lord God, let us not start hating ourselves. Let us not start beating ourselves up. But instead, say, Lord, I recognize it. I give it to you right now in Jesus' name. Because I want to be your faithful son. I want to be your faithful daughter. I want to be that child of yours that finds your grace and finds your favor. I don't want to be the younger son. I don't want to be the older son. I want to be the child instead that says, Lord, I just want to be yours. I just want to be yours. Father, I pray that you would convict us. Convict us, Lord God, of things that we do wrong. Convict us of, of, of sin in our life. But Father, I pray, convict us of self-righteousness. Convict us, Lord God, when it's our righteousness that's convicting us. And not necessarily our sin. Because I'm trying to be right without you. I'm trying to be good instead of godly. I'm trying to be godly without God's help. Father, I pray, help us. Help us. Because if we're not careful, we'll fall into this trap and it'll start corrupting and contaminating everything about us. It'll corrupt and contaminate our entire church. It'll, it's already corrupted and contaminated Christianity around the world. Father God, I pray, deliver us from this. Because Lord, I do not want to be a church that raises up, that raises up elder brothers. I want to be a church that raises up true sons and true daughters of the faith. Lead us, Lord God. Help us to recover the heart of the Christian faith. Help us to do this right. And Father, I just thank you. Put people in our path, Lord God, that we can love with grace this week. Put people in our path that we can love with grace and we can invite to church and, and have them come in. Help us, Lord God, to do this right. Help us, Lord. And when you're done with us, then take us home because time is short. Lord, I love you. Go with us. Watch over us. And Lord, we just give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. Amen. I love you guys. Apologize for going a little long tonight, but it was a powerful word. Shake somebody's hand. Hug your neck. Hug their neck. Don't hug your own. That's kind of elder brotherish. Y'all have a good night. We'll see y'all Sunday and, uh, or any of the other stuff going on. Don't forget Friday, pray for your nation. God bless y'all.